Hello and welcome to a special episode of Spectator TV. I'm Natasha Froze, the Spectator's broadcast producer, and today we're going to be talking about Rishi Sunak's first major reshuffle. I'm joined with Katie Balls and Fraser Nelson. Uh, Katie, has it finished yet? Is it still going? We're still in the process in the sense that this is a wide reshuffle. So we've had, obviously, the morning, as we discussed on the first podcast, the headline announcements of Suella Braverman sacked, David Cameron brought in, James Cleverly, the new Home Secretary. And we've now had most of the Cabinet appointments, but we're still going to be getting junior ranks going through in that sense. I think in terms of probably the most headline-grabbing news, It does go back to how the day began. I don't think it's quite competed with that. Mm. But you do have a few cabinet departures. Therese Coffey, she has left the cabinet. Steve Barkley has been demoted from health secretary to environment secretary. And then you have uh, Rishi's attempts to refresh his cabinet with new faces, even though he has quite an old face in it now, uh, in David Cameron. So Victoria Atkins is the new health secretary, 2017 intake. And then Laura Trott is the chief secretary of the treasury, 2019 intake take a former advisor to David Cameron um, so a theme there and then Richard Holden is um, ultimately in a new role too as party chairman. And Fraser in terms of the style of this reshuffle this hasn't been your usual way that a prime minister might go about it has it? No, this is um, completely bizarre. I mean, when it started this morning, um, Katie called me up quite early and I was expecting it to be... In the same way that Claire Cortina was made Energy Secretary, I thought that was a, a great chance to show somebody really talented, fresh blood, that the, the Sunak government was, as he said at the conference, going to sta- define itself against the failed consensus of the last 30 years. That was his phrase. A phrase which lumped together, deliberately lumped together, Cameron and Blair. Uh, so you think, well, this is the Sunak Commission then. He's going to draw a line here. Um, they may have all been Tories, but I'm a different sort of Conservative. So who then does he get for his first and probably last reshuffle? He gets uh, David Cameron, the man whose HS2 policy he overturned, the um, and a guy whose own foreign policy record wasn't exactly a, a gleaming success. Um but more to the point, there doesn't seem to be any of the 350 Tory MPs suitable for the post of Foreign Secretary. Now, given that this party has been in power for 14 years, you'd think they could have just one person who'd been elected who was good for that job. And David Cameron wasn't even in the House of Lords. He had to get the King to put him in the House of Lords. Uh, so it is such a strange departure for our democracy. Uh, normally, the deal is that you you choose the, the team that the voters give you. I mean, sure, you can appoint somebody. Rarely you might get a special sort of... If there's an if, if there's a, um, emergency, for example, in asylum, then you might be able to get somebody who can handle the Ukrainian refugees. That's what happened recently. But when it comes to foreign secretary, this would be about the face that you want to show to the world. Now, the face is now on the four great offices of state, not a single woman. Uh, we've got three PPE graduates, um, Sunak, um, Jeremy Hunt and David Cameron. We've got from the schools of Winchester, Charterhouse and Eton. There is something kind of quite old school about this. But the problem for a prime minister wishing to refresh his government is that bringing back somebody as well known as David Cameron doesn't say refresh, it says rewind. And I think for the impression a lot of voters are going to get right now is of a Conservative Party which is out of ideas and out of personnel. And that's why it's not even bringing back all the MPs, it's um, bringing back people who've retired, putting them in the House of Lords. And uh, let's, uh, um, then the other issue of how on earth are you going, is Parliament going to hold to account a Foreign Secretary who can't um, set foot in the House of Commons because he's a Lord? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think if you look at it in terms of, I suppose, the arguments for David Cameron, um, the argument being made by those who support that decision is they think, well, this is an experienced politician, serious politician, serious times. You think about what's happening in the world and he will have clout when it comes to speaking to other foreign leaders um, and, you know, counterparts. They also, I think, uh, you know, I think as Fraser has just said, and I said, I've said many times today, it doesn't seem to be consistent with the change message from Tory conference and that 30 year moment. Um, But the counter that has been made to me since then is actually, um, well, 
one of the problems they said is not so much with individuals and you thought about the past 30 years. One of the problems is more just the way decision making and governing has happened. So actually rewarding people who have lots of experience is a good thing to do. Now, those are some of the arguments we made for David Cameron. I think in terms of where the Tory party is, there are lots of MPs who are very happy to see David Cameron return. I was walking around Parliament being stopped, being like, there's a grown-up back. He would have thought would have got a sensible member around the cabinet table. But they all tend to be figures who either served in a Cameron government or on the One Nation wing. And so therefore, I think by having a situation whereby uh, he sacks Sarah Bravman, which I think you could have said was about a challenge to Rishi Sunak's authority, but combining that bringing David Cameron back it's the right of the party who uh, see the most glum today and it's the One Nation Tories who are reading it as a win for their faction they're part of the party and for example tonight you have the new Conservatives meeting and that is the uh, intake of 2019 MPs quite a few of them are in that group and they tend to be in red wall seats no not all of them and they have a weekly meeting so I think we can get a bit too excited in some ways and say oh this is all about trying to bring down Rishi Sunak but I think it's certainly in the case that this group will um, and the ones I was talking to are a bit concerned by some of the direction in this reshuffle and the idea it is moving away I think from some of the 2019 messaging and Katie could you talk a little bit about what it might look like having David Cameron as the foreign secretary but being based in the Lords Yes, yeah, so now, as a result of this appointment, David Cameron joins the Lords. So obviously, lots of MPs are asking, was there really not a single Tory MP who could have done this role run adding to the House of Lords? Um, but it means if you have Minister Lords, they will address the House of Lords, and therefore, it would not be the Foreign Secretary addressing the House of Commons. Now, and instead, it would be the most senior minister, senior lead. Now, because the junior ranks are still to be reshuffled, we don't know exactly who that could be. But for example, it could be someone like Andrew Mitchell, who would then be the stand in for any statements David Cameron gives in the House of Lords, that person would give in the House of Commons. The Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle, has voiced some concern over the arrangement. And so he's looking at precedent and if there was a way, given how serious foreign affairs are, whether it's the war in Ukraine, what's happening in the Middle East, um, I think the suggestion from the speaker is it's a really unideal situation to have it so your foreign secretary cannot face scrutiny in all these questions and um, so I think they're looking at whether there are some ways to perhaps not have David Cameron in the House of Commons but what they can do to improve the options for scrutiny. Uh, David Frost was um, a member of Lords who was last in government and he earlier on um, just put out um, a, a as a statement saying that he found this was a pretty bad situation because the Lords fundamentally isn't political. If you're if you're a member of a Lords, you can get scrutinised by other Lords, but these are guys who aren't really holding you to account in the same way that the House of Commons does. Now, you can argue that the Foreign Secretary isn't really that he's basically a mascot, uh, and Sweden had in Carl Bildt, a former Prime Minister who was given that role. Um, you could say that, um, that the, the US had a John Kerry, who was a State Secretary, now, he was a sort of uh, you know, a, a, a former presidential candidate set out to be an ambassador. You could also look around the world and say, look, there's now there's a market for the Tony Blairs of this world, the the Bill Clintons. They're sort of freelance statesmen anyway. So um, let's see if we can take advantage of this and put Cameron in that role. And I think he will be able to do that part of the job um, pretty well. It's also quite possible that we don't actually see or hear from him that much. We tend to see pictures of a foreign secretary, but seldom see, tend to see them in action. So perhaps on a day-to-day basis, it wouldn't really make that much difference. But we might see David Cameron popping up on the sofas now on Sunday mornings to, to give the interviews or perhaps trying to defend the government, although... Obviously, given that he disagrees fundamentally with Brexit, the country's main foreign policy, he disagrees fundamentally with the decision to reverse HS2, Sunak's flagship policy, he might have um, a bit of um, verbal gymnastics to perform if he wants to come across as being fully supportive of his predecessor. Um, But I'm told that um, he's got an answer ready. If he's asked, has he changed his mind about Brexit, then he might have an interesting response. I'm not quite sure we're going to get a Damascene conversion from him thinking, yes, I should have voted um, to leave all of his time. But one of the most important jobs of a foreign secretary is how to persuade the many diplomats that are working for you how to sell Brexit 
to the outside world. Once when Boris Johnson was foreign secretary, he invited me into the foreign office to speak to diplomats uh, because he was saying it was so difficult to find somebody who was supportive of Brexit or could see the advantages. But it was really quite difficult to tell the diplomats um, how, where were the upsides. Now, I wasn't sure I was particularly the best qualified person to do that, but it was a real problem in a foreign office that was fundamentally against Brexit. Now, can David Cameron be the person to turn that around? That will be quite a challenge for him. But then again, we are talking about a government with um, probably 12 months to the next election. Um, And you can see, you can absolutely see why Cameron was used. But you can also see why if you're Keir Starmer, you're rubbing your hands now thinking that this is all the proof you need, that an exhausted Conservative Party has nothing more to give. And uh, lastly, Katie, I think lots of people are talking about the fact that there's been so much turnover with ministers for for so many years now. Obviously, we've had Boris Johnson and then Liz Truss as well. Um, Do you think that it was wise for Rishi Sunak to go for such a dramatic reshuffle and and, and change so so many of his cabinet in the lead up to a general election? Well, ultimately, one of the problems Rishi Sunak has is... If you look at, for example, the King's speech last week, lots of people said, well, it's not going to move the dial. You know, this isn't going to change anything. And therefore, you continue with the status quo of your, you know, the same direction your government's going in. How, that might be all very well if it's just a couple of points between the two parties. Um, but you need to do something. Now he has done something. I don't think it's going to massively change the polls, but he clearly thinks it's going to get there. So I think he's probably in a bit of a lose-lose. I think there are some moves such as, you know, changing housing minister again. So it's now been a, a crazy number of housing the ministers. 16th housing minister since 2010. Right. At a time when Labour are really going on the attack on housing with their plans to break up, you know, shake up planning reform. Um, and I think the Tories are quite vulnerable there. So I think doing that does give the opposition something really easy to say, which is, you know, you don't you don't take this issue very seriously. Look how much churn you've had. That said, I think Lee Rowley, who was taking it over the brief, is someone who does really want to build houses. So, but how much can you really do in that time? So, I think there were. I think Rishi did need to have a reshuffle because there are also quite a lot of ministers, which we haven't really spoken about on this podcast. Mm. But there are quite a lot of ministers who have wanted to step down so they can focus on their seats, um, focus on trying to keep their seat, and really be a constituency MP between now and the next election. Um, So he did need to clean things up. But I think speaking to MPs, there is a sense that he should have done this before the summer, when there was more time to get to know your brief and then do things. Whereas now, you know, this government is really running short of time. And I think therefore it's a question as to how much really um, they're going to be achieving and if it's more about signalling things ahead of the election. There's two things which they really want to happen on Wednesday. One is the inflation data. The number 10 wants to see a significant decrease in inflation, and the markets do expect that. The other thing is the Rwanda decision from the Supreme Court. Uh, it could well be that they get a green light for takeoff for the Rwanda deportations. If so, then this, this flight should be leaving in a few weeks' time. And that could create a helpful fuss for Rishi Sunak because it would be deeply controversial, but most of the public are on his side on this. But if the inflation figures disappoint or if the Supreme Court is, um, is inconclusive, it might say, for example, you need a treaty, so it has to go to negotiate a treaty with Rwanda, or they simply might say, no, we don't think this flies, then he will be back to square one. Katie wrote in her political column um, in the current issue of the magazine that the only other thing they've got to do is the is the, the mini-budget. Um, two fateful words now that Liz Truss made her so dramatic, but that's coming uh, later on this month. But even that isn't suspected to move the dial. I'm not sure that Cameron's return or the reshuffle will move the dial, but if inflation really does start to fall quickly, and given the money supply figures, there's a good chance it will do, or if um, the Rwanda policy goes the government's way, that might be um, Sunak's hope. But then again, if he's 20 points behind in the polls, he's got so much, and they, they want it ideally to be 10 points behind by Christmas. Right now, I think they'll be very lucky to be 15 points behind by Christmas. And at this rate, you really struggle to see how on earth that they can plot the way to victory. Katie and Fraser, thanks for joining us.